We will move to our final important sessions of the meeting, our last two sessions today. Um, to begin, we will, I will introduce um, part one of our systematic review quality toolkit uh, sessions. The first one is on the evaluation and management of spontaneous pneumothorax. Please welcome, I don't see Dr. Bear, uh, but Dr. Elizabeth Speck from the University of Michigan, Dr. Sean St. Peter from Children's Mercy, Kansas City, Dr. Don Lucas from uh, Naval Medical Center, San Diego, Dr. Afif Kulayat, Kulailat from the Division of Pediatric Surgery at Penn State Children's Hershey. Uh, there's Dr. Joanne Berg um, from Presbyterian Health System. And I think we have Dr. Amy Lawrence from the University of Rochester for part two as well. Um, so I will turn it over to the first speaker, Dr. St. Peter. All right, good morning and uh, congratulations to everybody who made it to the very last session. So we're starting with a patient, healthy 16-year-old, has a sizable pneumothorax, no history of trauma. So how do you want to manage this initially? Observation, aspiration, chest tube, with the intention of treating with the chest tube, chest tube to bats, straight to bats. And let's go to the app and we're going to do a little experiment here. Spec was working to see if we could get it moved over to see the results. And all right, look at the look at the data mature from the six people left in the crowd. Okay, another six <laughs> online. That was just for you, Kathy. All right, let's advance to the next slide. I think that makes the point of why we did the systematic review. So primary spontaneous pneumothorax, of course, is those without an inciting event, typically tall, thin males, just like the pectus patients. Incidence is between 1.3 and 5.3 per 100,000. There's a huge variability in practice, which is why we took on this review, and there is no accepted management or uh, diagnostic pathways. So we developed six a priori questions through the typical methodology that we do on the outcomes committee. They're vetted through the whole group and morphed into what we finally launch. And then we register with Prospero. We only chose the VATS era, so we started from 1990 forward. Because this is an adolescent disease, we used 26 as a cutoff, and we used minors criteria for our bias assessments. And those questions were, just as the one last post, how do we initially treat a patient? Do we need advanced imaging? When is the optimal time to operate for the patient who is admitted with a chest tube? Once you get to that operation, what's the most effective operation? How do you deal with the opposite side? And then what about those that recur? We used rayon, and this is our prisma diagram. I'll just draw attention to the fact that the number that is listed for each question is the novel manuscripts, not the total number used for each question, but we had 79 papers that we, that we used. There's a strong presence from Asia, as you can see, <clears throat> with this disease process. And we progressively had more manuscripts we were able to use as time went by, starting from 99. So the summative data, we start with looking at a chest tube. And for those who use a chest tube, there's comparative studies that are comparing 12 French or less, which is a pigtail equivalent, or 14 French and larger. A meta-analysis of comparing those two shows that smaller tubes can be used to treat spontaneous pneumothorax. There isn't a, a big difference in outcomes. Some studies have shown less length of stay, but that's more of a choice. So then we move to aspiration. The reason pigtails work is because we're just getting out air. We're not trying to evacuate a hemothorax. And if we can get air out with a small tube, then what about just getting it out with an aspiration, just suck it out one time? There's been two randomized trials comparing tube to aspiration, uh, both in young adults, 137 and 40 patients, showing no difference in success, um, but an overall reduction in length of stay with aspiration. With these data, the Midwest Consortium took on um, a prospective observational study where aspiration was mimicked by putting in a quick thal tube and then putting a clamp on it. 
for six hours, get a chest x-ray, everyone's fine, they can go home without being admitted. Um, and then if they got admitted, they went by uh, physician choice. So then we ask the next question, if you can suck it out, what about just watching it? And if you're gonna do an aspiration and then repeat a chest x-ray, what about just repeat a chest x-ray? And the, probably the best um, evidence that we had looking at this entire question was the multi-center randomized trial done in Australia with 316 patients randomized to either um, observation or an intervention. The intervention was an aspiration put to water seal if improved, the stopcock was closed, repeat chest x-ray, and they get to go home. If worsening, then it's opened and they're treated with suction. The observation pathway prevented an intervention in 85% of the patients, so overwhelmingly successful. In aggregate, including those that crossed over to aspiration, there were fewer hospital days, fewer adverse events, less operations, and it produced the same resolution rate at eight weeks. So the conclusion was that observation is a reasonable starting point in any treatment algorithm. So to answer question one, the initial therapy can consist of observation if the severity of symptoms uh, and the patient stability allow, which they typically do, which is a grade eight recommendation. If an immediate intervention is required, aspiration is at least equivalent to a chest tube placement, which is a grade B recommendation. And if a chest tube is required, a small bore is all that needs to be used. So moving to the second question, when do we get advanced imaging? So in your practice, if you have a spontaneous pneumothorax, when do you get a CT? Always, never, only in complex situation, or when mom asks for it. Looks like we can move to the next slide. Most people only get it in a complex situation. So there were early studies that suggested that if you can identify bull or blebs that you could um, justify an operation even if it's prophylactic bilateral for the asymptomatic side. And then further retrospective studies found a poor correlation between CT findings and subsequent recurrence suggesting that advanced imaging um, doesn't help in guiding decision making. A separate pediatric series looked at those with no CT compared to those who had a normal CT compared to those with an abnormal CT, and there was no difference in recurrence. Conversely, comparing all the recurrences to no recurrence, there was no difference in the percentage of abnormal CT. In an adult series with 140 patients, um, they compared those with a preoperative CT to those without a preoperative CT, and again, the recurrence was the same. So they conclude that CT scanning is not justified. In the most complete study on this question, um, there was a study done in Korea where they took 299 patients who had a quality high-resolution CT preoperatively, and they were able to respond to a five-year follow-up. So they had complete um, five-year follow-up. And in that, they calculated a dystrophy severity score, which is based on the presence, size, number, and bilaterality of blebs. They categorized them into three risk groups, the low-risk group, 0, 3, moderate in the middle, and then high. The presence of blebs, their size, number, dystrophy score were all not predictive of recurrence, and most remarkably, the low risk group, those without blebs, had the exact same five-year recurrence rate at 32.8% compared to those in the high risk group who had multiple large bilateral blebs. So it appears that there is no need for advanced imaging as it uh, does not predict recurrence and a negative test does not provide reassurance. And all of the great visuals here were provided by the fabulous Elizabeth Speck, who is up next. So we'll start with another polling question. How do you in your practice, or how long do you wait to operate on spontaneous pneumothorax? If they come in when you're on call, they're getting an operation. Maybe you wait 24 hours after a failed aspiration test, 48 hours after chest tube dissection, or maybe you give them 70, seven days, or maybe something else. 
So a little all over the place, but it looks like most people wait 48 hours after a chest tube's on suction. We can go to the slides. So to answer this question, when's the optimal time to operate? There were 23 manuscripts and 12 were found to be appropriate for inclusion. This is just a table to show those manuscripts and I just draw your attention to the far right column, which is the level of evidence available to us. There was one prospective randomized trial with 41 patients at a single institution. The most rigorous data came from the MWPSC study that Sean uh, referenced. Um, it was a prospective observational but multi-institutional study with 33 patients. And then a FIS database study with over 1,000 patients included. But the remaining um, manuscripts were predominantly retrospective and uh, mostly single institution. So with the available data we have to answer this question, when's the optimal time to operate, we offer you these three conclusions. If you have an air leak and or an inability to resolve your pneumothorax on a chest x-ray, this may be predictive of failure and can guide your decision making for early surgery. Prolonged chest tube management is unlikely to change your overall outcome and is therefore not recommended. And although early is not defined, <clears throat> well defined or standardized across any of these studies, a range of six hours after a failed aspiration up to 72 hours after chest tube placement with an ongoing air leak seems to be a reasonable time frame. These are all grade C recommendations based on the data you've seen. So Don and I are going to tackle, now that you've committed this patient to an operation, um, what is the most effective operation to do? Um, so when we defined effectiveness, we used the rate of ipsilateral recurrence uh, to decide whether the operation was more or less successful between the different categorizations we used of techniques. Uh, we used studies only that included at least one year of follow-up, uh, as there were uh, uh, quite a number of studies uh, with follow-up rates of three months or something around that time range, which uh, really made it difficult to uh, know whether their results were sustained. Other outcomes that we considered included pain, chest tube duration, length of stay. Uh, some of these factors really reflect more practice patterns than necessarily the effectiveness of the operation. And other outcomes like pain were just very variably reported and difficult to standardize across studies. Um, for our methods, we conducted a single-arm meta-analysis. This is otherwise known as a one-way meta-analysis. Uh, the majority of studies were retrospective series, uh, but this technique allows us to create a pooled estimate of a recurrence rate from the available studies. Uh, we used a freely available package on R called Metaprop, uh, and then that applies either uh, random effects or fixed effects models, uh, as you designate, um, based on the heterogeneity of the data. And then we used inverse uh, weighting variants um, to assign weights to the different studies available. In certain studies, there were a number of techniques that were compared. And for the purpose of creating aggregate data, these arms were then separated and compared within their designated groups of operations. So we, there's a large variety of uh, operative techniques. We broke them into six different categories. Uh, they all involve a wedge resection or a blebectomy. So category one was blebectomy alone. Next was blebectomy plus pleural abrasion, which is sometimes referred to as mechanical, but I think abrasion is a much clearer term for future use. Um, Blebectomy plus pleurectomy, which is sometimes subcategorized within the mechanical category, so I think pleurectomy is a good term for that. Um, blebectomy plus chemical, various types of chemicals used, including talc or uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, combo, which is blebectomy plus a mechanical technique, either abrasion or pleurectomy, and then adding on a chemical. And then um, staple line coverage, which is a technique that's used mainly in East Asia where they use mainly Vicryl mesh or Surgicel and sometimes fibrin glue to glue over the staple line. It both seals the staple line in theory as well as provides some sort of some degree of pleuridesis. So this is the result of our one-way meta-analysis for each separate technique. It's very important to note that these pooled estimates are not comparable to each other. 
nor can you do hypothesis testing between two different arms, but we got a number for each technique. So blobectomy without pleurodesis, those are the studies. You can see um, the ends there and each individual study's uh, estimate, but the overall recurrence rate was 14.5%, uh, which was um, the highest. Um, two of these studies were prospective randomized trials. I would note that both of these studies show uh, uh, lower recurrence than the overall estimate, which is creates some conflicting data later in our recommendations. Um, next, lobectomy and pleural abrasion. This was the most common technique used. The overall recurrence was 8.9%. And three of these studies were prospective randomized trials. Next, lobectomy with pleurectomy. 2.9% recurrence. We're not comparing, but pretty good. Um, and one of which was a prospective randomized controlled trial. Uh, Blobectomy and chemical pleurodesis, and uh, under the studies you can see which chemical they used. The overall recurrence rate was 4.3%, um, and two of which were an RCT, it was within one RCT, but just different arms. and blobectomy with staple line coverage. All these studies are out of East Asia. The overall recurrence rate was 12%, and one of these studies was a prospective randomized control trial. Um, and then here is blobectomy with mechanical and chemical combination pleurodesis. Some of the, most of these are abrasion, but a few of these are pleurectomy. Overall recurrence rate, 4.3% two of which were randomized controlled trials, same author, different manuscript, different patients. So then we took the overall pooled estimate for each of the six techniques and plotted them together, so you can just sort of compare them side by side. Again, no um, hypothesis testing is allowed here because the statistics won't allow it, but you can sort of see a visual reference of the, the various pooled estimates, and everyone can make their decisions, and here are our recommendations. Um, so when we consider the most effective operation um, from a review of the literature, a stapled blobectomy uh, should be performed. Uh, and this is a grade B recommendation supported by these levels um, of evidence. Uh, other techniques that were described in the literature include using uh, an endo loop to uh, ligate the blebs, uh, using a ligature uh, as well, but uh, these have really not been extensively studied and uh, virtually the majority of the other studies all use the stapled blobectomy. Um, other things that have been described are performing prophylactic upper uh, uh, and uh, lower lobe apex wedge resections when blebs were not definitively delineated, um, but uh, these were also not looked at in any formal comparative way uh, to be able to draw conclusions uh, about the effectiveness uh, of this technique. A plural procedure should be performed to decrease the recurrence. Uh, we gave this a grade C recommendation because of the level of contradictory uh, evidence that was available between kind of some level two studies as well as the uh, level in three, four studies as well. Uh, there really is not sufficient evidence to be able to say which specific plural procedure should be performed in that uh, context. And uh, as uh, Don had mentioned, th this statistical methodology is not designed to allow for comparisons between techniques. But just looking purely, you know, at the numbers from the average experience in the literature, um, abrasion pleurodesis alone, as well as stapen line coverage, seem to have the highest recurrence rates. Um, and uh, really, this, this shows the need for um, solid level one um, data to help us uh, determine uh, the best and most effective operation uh, in this clinical entity. And I would put out a challenge that none of the randomized or even prospective data that we included were from North America. Um, there's talk about putting a consortium together to study this prospectively, and we think that that should be done. The next polling question is, in your practice, how do you manage the asymptomatic opposite side? Is each side treated individually 
or do I base my practice on chest x-ray findings? If there are blebs on CT, I offer a VATS. If the first side recurs after VATS, I automatically operate on the opposite side. So how should the asymptomatic contralateral side be managed? For this question, 23 manuscripts were reviewed, 11 were included, there were nine retrospective reviews with multivariate analysis and two descriptive series that met our criteria. There's a lot of variability in these articles in that six included patients that had undergone VATS only but three analyzed conservative and surgical therapy together, and two, the cohorts were all managed with conservative therapy. However, all the patients that were included in all of these papers had undergone high-resolution CT scanning. So um, this column shows the um, the percent of contralateral recurrence rate over a follow-up period that varied from about 20 to 92 months. And um, when factors associated with recurrence were analyzed in these papers, um, in almost all of them, having bullae on the CT scan was not significant. The factors that were significant were younger age, a previous ipsilateral recurrence, or a lower um, BMI. And these papers were the ones where conservative therapy was analyzed, and um, the authors looked at recurrence on the opposite side. Um, the time to opposite side recurrence was about 12 months. Those that had blebs on CT scan um, over a longer follow-up uh, period of time did not um, have any recurrence, and if they did have blebs, the recurrence rate over about a five-year follow-up was about 20%. So that meant that even with blebs, 80% um, did not have a spontaneous pneumothorax on the opposite side during the recurrence, um, or during the follow-up period. So how should the asymptomatic opposite side be treated? The presence of, on high-resolution high CT of blebs and bullae was not significant for contralateral occurrence in nine papers when this factor was combined with other factors. The factors that were significant were younger age, lower BMI, a previous ipsilateral recurrence, and these were all factors that were also independently associated with an ipsilateral recurrence. So I would argue that this just reflects the underlying uh, disease process that is leading to a spontaneous pneumothorax. If, when five-year contralateral recurrence is examined, if there are no blebs, there was essentially no contralateral recurrence reported. If blebs are present, the rate is about 18%. So therefore, if all patients um, that had contralateral blebs underwent a VATS procedure, at least three quarters would probably get an unnecessary operation. So therefore, the recommendation is that prophylactic VATS for contralateral disease in the absence of symptoms is not recommended, and there's no indication to obtain a CT scan to assess the opposite side, as CT scan findings were essentially never coming out prominently in multivariate analysis. And this is a grade C recommendation based on heterogeneous level three and four retrospective data. Our next question was, how should recurrence after VATS be managed? And we looked at nine studies um, to answer this question. The patient inclusion criteria was quite variable. The choice of uh, operative therapy or conservative therapy also varied. This was all surgeon-specific practice. All the patients in these studies did undergo a VATS with bolectomy, but the approach to the pleura was quite different, as some um, my colleagues had presented. And also, all of the studies had a completely different, slightly different definition of recurrence, so that also makes them 
challenging to put together and challenging to interpret. Um, what we tried to pull out of these studies was if the patient had a VATS and the VATS failed, uh, what did the authors do? And um, so here's the first uh, five of the studies. And um, the ipsilateral recurrence rate varied from 2% to as high as 17%. The median time to recurrence was about a year. Um, these studies almost all had uh, five-year follow-up rates. The authors um, under the immediate redo VATS, you can see uh, when the patients recurred, most surgeons just decided to redo the VATS and then intensify the therapy. So they would redo the VATS with mechanical pleuridesis or they would add mesh or minocycline. And then in this final column, you can see that over the follow-up time, almost all the patients where their VATS was done again with intensification of therapy, it's reported that they did not recur. There are two papers where some authors did report that they tried either observation or chest tube placement. And of those patients, around two-thirds of those patients would then go on to, to fail that therapy, and then they would go to a redo operation. Um, only one paper really specifically looked at if you fail your VATS, um, what, um, what are we really going to evaluate? Most of them were just um, heterogeneous reports. These are the other four papers that are quite similar. Um, so you can see most surgeons would just redo the VATS and intensify the therapy. There was one study where if the um, pneumothorax after VATS was quite small, they would observe or place a chest tube, and they reported that that was successful. But that is really only one paper. The majority uh, of papers showed that surgeons choose to redo the VATS, and it seems to work. And if conservative therapy is done, the failure rate is about two-thirds. So how should recurrence after VATS be managed? The ipsilateral recurrence rate after VATS is anywhere from 1 to 16 percent. Um, most will fail between six to 36 months, and the majority fail around one year after the first operation. It tends to be just surgeon-specific practice as far as what they do with their patients if their VATS fails, and um, the plura approach to the plura as well as the follow-up time periods for these studies is quite variable. One study specifically examined the failure of conservative approach after a VATS recurrence, and they reported um, that conservative therapy fails about two-thirds of the time. And this is similar in other studies with small cohorts. Eight studies reported that uh, surgeons choose to just redo the VATS for failures, and they will intensify the treatment of the pleura. And during the follow-up period, then almost none of these patients seem to fail. So we would recommend that if a VATS fails and a pneumothorax recurs, you can consider observation or chest tube placement if this pneumothorax is small and asymptomatic. But just keep in mind the failure rate varies up to 60%. If that happens, um, one could have a low threshold to perform a redo VATS and intensify the plural approach. This appears to have a high success rate in multiple reports, but these are all just re retrospective um, level four evidence. Um, so this is a grade C recommendation with level four evidence. And our final question is, will you change your practice as a result of the data presented today? Thank you. So the poll results are coming in, and uh, it seems like many of you would uh, consider changing your practice. Uh, so that's, uh, that's great. For the best interest of time, uh, we're going to roll into the um, uh, toolkit discussion, and then we'll do questions um, in the end. Um, so uh, myself, and I'm joined by a colleague, Dr. Uh, Amy Lawrence, who's a resident at University of Rochester and recently matched into UC Irvine. Uh, 
for Pete's surgery, so we're very excited for her. Um, we are going to share some of the work uh, from the quality toolkit side of things uh, that uh, our committee has been working on. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the APSA Quality and Safety Toolkit, I'd like to review how you would access it and show you some of the resources that are available. Uh, we'll describe some of the um, algorithms and uh, clinical guidelines that have been shared with us. Uh, and then in particular, we're going to focus on, uh, I think, a really well done QI project that highlights uh, how we can use QI project methodology to improve outcomes in spontaneous pneumothorax. Um, so this is the APSA website. Um, if you uh, go to the resources tab, uh, you will see that the quality and safety toolkit is a, a link that's available. Uh, when you click on it, it will take you to a Google Drive uh, type website. Uh, and this uh, website really represents the cumulative efforts uh, of everyone on the quality and safety uh, committee that have worked uh, hard through the, through the year to help curate um, best practices, uh, clinical guidelines, algorithms, uh, QI projects um, that are out there. And this is done from a review of the literature, um, things that we find at meetings and other discussions. And so all these resources are shared here. Uh, they're publicly uh, available. Um, here are some of the other topics included. And then we're going to focus on uh, pneumothorax and um, venous thromboembolism in the next session. So uh, when you open this folder, you'll see here, this is what the web page would look like. Um, there are uh, five children's hospitals that have shared resources uh, with us, and I'll just walk you through a couple of them. Um, if you clicked on Texas Children's, uh, you would see here uh, what's called a read first file, and this is uh, a narrative provided by, the, by a contact at that institution that describes how they've used this algorithm, what challenges they may have encountered, and uh, again, a contact in case you're interested in learning more information. Uh, and then here is uh, the TCH uh, algorithm uh, that they use uh, to help work through spontaneous pneumothorax. Uh, again, this is available on the website, uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time going through this. Uh, additionally, from their evidence-based outcome center, they've provided us with their kind of critical appraisal of the literature that have helped them decide what interventions should be recommended with what, you know, grade of recommendation or quality of data. Um, here, this was recently shared with us from Children's Hospital of Orange County. Um, here is uh, their spontaneous pneumothorax guideline. And again, it works through how they manage small or larger pneumothoraces. Additionally, they've included other you know, recommendations. And um, it's very small, but you can see here that it says that, uh, well, I don't really know where my mouse is, but it says that the CT scan is, is not routinely indicated, kind of going along with uh, things that we've discussed at our uh, uh, just prior session. Uh, they've also included some of their discharge recommendations as well. Um, we're going to spend a little bit more time on the uh, Midwest Aspiration Study, uh, and the QI project of interest is, uh, is uh, from Nationwide. Uh, and I'm going to let Dr. Lawrence uh, talk a little bit more about these uh, projects as she was um, uh, intimately involved with both of them. Uh, this is just what the Midwest Consortium uh, link looks like. These were resources that were shared with us um, that they used throughout the course uh, of their study. So I just wanted to briefly review this Midwest study because it was designed, again, with the purpose of defining an algorithm for the treatment of spontaneous pneumothorax that would avoid prolonged hospitalizations and minimize recurrence. This has been presented at APSA previously, but we utilized this pathway as part of our protocol at NCH, so I wanted to review some of the key components. So this slide shows the enrollment and intervention for patients who consented to the study. Only patients who presented with their first episode were eligible for enrollment. Patients were initially treated with aspiration of the air via small bore catheter with a chest x-ray completed immediately afterward to assess for expansion of the lung. And if there was success with the initial aspiration, the patient was observed for six hours with the pigtail capped and another chest x-ray obtained. If the chest x-ray demonstrated no signs of recurrence, the pigtail was removed and the patient was discharged home. But if the patient failed aspiration, they were managed based on surgeon preference. The study enrolled 33 patients, and of those 33, aspiration was unsuccessful in 17, 12 of whom went on to chest tube management, and of those 12, 83% failed chest tube management. So these results indicate that aspiration as a test predicts failure of non-operative management with an 83% positive predictive value. And then we're, we're just going to highlight the uh, QI project that was done at Nationwide. So 
for the, this project at Nationwide, we designed our protocol with the goal of standardizing care of patients with spontaneous pneumothorax at our institution in order to decrease their average hospital length of stay and decrease radiation exposure related to diagnostic imaging. So this is the key driver diagram we created for our project. Our overall goal was to reduce variation and improve care. And our primary aim was to decrease the average length of stay for patients admitted with a spontaneous pneumothorax from 4.5 days to 3.5 days and sustain that decrease for one year. We identified a couple of key drivers to help us achieve our aim. And the interventions that we employed to achieve those key drivers included analyzing the cost of care, developing a clinical staff training program that utilized the clinical pathway that we developed, which also included evaluation of our current guidelines for CT scans and x-rays. And um, you know, just to elaborate briefly, the, the key driver diagram, or the KDD, really uh, forms the backbone of any QI project. And, um, uh, you know, the important thing is you start with your goal and you work backwards. You then help use that to materialize your aim. And when you're looking at your aim, you really want to make sure that you have a measurable outcome that you're trying to improve. You want to designate a time period that this is going to occur over. And then, you know, as part of the, the process of sustaining and keeping up with results, you want to designate, you know, what your intentions are to keep that uh, process going. From that, you can populate your key drivers and then really focus on what interventions are needed to help manifest, you know, that goal in the end. Okay, so this is the pathway that we created, which is available on the APSA Toolkit website. Uh, I'll briefly review it here just in a little bit more detail. So we divided patients up into the episode of occurrence of pneumothorax. So patients who were admitted with their first episode but had a relatively small pneumothorax and were asymptomatic were observed for 12 hours, had a repeat chest x-ray, and if it was stable and they were still asymptomatic, they were discharged home. However, if their pneumothorax was greater than two rib spaces or they were symptomatic, we performed aspiration as per the Midwest protocol and they were discharged if successful. If the aspiration failed, they were placed to suction for two days, and if there was no leak, a water seal trial was obtained, and if that was successful, they were discharged home. However, if they still had a leak after two days, they were taken to the OR for a VATS. Those patients who were admitted with their second episode were allowed to decide with their family and the surgeon whether they would prefer to re re repeat the first episode management or proceed directly to the operating room for VATS. For the third episode, we recommended uh, direct, you know, admission for a VATS procedure when appropriate. Additionally, we recommended no CT for workup and no x-ray be performed after chest tube removal. So this is the control chart for our average length of stay. The average length of stay for all patients admitted with a spontaneous pneumothorax is shown on the dotted line, and the number of patients admitted per month with a spontaneous pneumothorax is shown on the row at the bottom. Our protocol was initiated in September of 2018, and after initiation of the protocol, we saw a decrease in average length of stay from 4.5 to 2.9 days. Um, now, uh, a control chart, um, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, is, is really an excellent uh, tool in QI to help track an outcome, uh, or otherwise known as a process measure, um, over a period of time. And uh, you can see here the data points are reflected by the diamonds. Um, the, the averages are uh, designated by the dashed lines. You can see when the protocol was initiated, the green dashed line indicates what their goal was, uh, and they were actually able to achieve uh, a goal even less than what they had designated earlier. The red dashed lines represent what are called the upper and lower control limits, and these are three standard deviations uh, from the mean, so they're almost like a confidence interval. And so data points that lie outside of this are called special cause events or outliers and deserve further um, investigation as to why those occur because they're beyond normal variation. You can see here that after the protocol was initiated, not only did the mean drop in the process measure, but the control limits also tightened and narrowed as there was less variation after implementation um, of the uh, protocol. Um, and then there are very specific rules that govern whether a trend has occurred, a small shift, a large shift. And so, you know, when doing this kind of work, I, I I'd encourage you all to work with someone with expertise in QI methodology. Uh, in this specific case, um, a shift had occurred thanks to the implementation of the protocol. And this is generally designated by anywhere from six to nine points, depending on whose rules you use, beyond the previously established process mean, which allowed them to establish a new mean, uh, which was uh, consistent with their goal. 
I'll elaborate a little bit more about this at the end, but you can see in the kind of third quarter of 2019, there were a number of points that were outside the control limits, and uh, I'll discuss that a little further towards the end. So this is our, our control chart for the average number of x-rays per admission. And here we were able to decrease the average number of x-rays from 8.8 .8 to 5.9 after initiation of the protocol. With regards to our other secondary outcomes, we were able to find a significant decrease in our CT scan rate from 45% to 15%. We also decreased the cost per admission. Uh, another important uh, consideration when designing a QI project is uh, considering what your balancing measure is. And you can think of this as uh, the outcome that could be potentially negatively influenced by implementation of your QI project. Uh, in this case, recurrence was selected, and as you can see, pre and post protocol, um, there was no difference in their uh, balancing measure as a result um, of the protocol. Additionally, you know, compliance, we talk about PDSA cycles, and the important thing here is that it's a cycle. You want to reevaluate your results uh, as you progress through. And here they uh, were evaluating their outcomes based on quarters. And you can see here in the third quarter of 2019, there was a dip in compliance. And when you think back to that control chart we reviewed earlier, uh, it's not surprising that there were a number of outliers or special cause events that occurred uh, during that time period. And so that, were, that was part of the challenges of a study like this, and uh, I'll let Dr. Lawrence elaborate further. So um, again, challenges with these kind of uh, projects are things such as compliance, uh, turnover in house staff, numerous fellows, the fact that a spontaneous pneumothorax is a relatively infrequent occurrence, and we did develop a relatively complex pathway. So in order to overcome those challenges, we attempted to provide frequent re-education and reorientation, pocket card handouts so that house staff could have them available at all times, and widespread dissemination of the pathways online, and again, in handheld paper or form so that there was easy access for all members of staff. So in conclusion, by standardizing the pathway for treatment of spontaneous pneumothorax, we were able to decrease our length of stay, radiation exposure, and hospital costs without increasing inc recurrence. So, you know, taking advantage of everyone that's here who might be listening online as well, um, you know, if this is something that you're interested in or you're doing work at your institution to try to standardize or improve outcomes, um, you know, we'd, lo we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we'd love to be able to share your resources with others so that we can all learn together. Um, if you have anything, please feel free to email myself uh, or, or Devin Pace, who's a, a great research resident at Jefferson, uh, doing research at DuPont now, who has been instrumental to maintaining this, um, this toolkit. Um, and I, I think you can see from this how uh, the resources that we all share from each other, we can learn from and how the Midwest Aspiration Study was incorporated into the nationwide QI study. Um, you can see things that we learned uh, previously about CT scan usage and you know, pushing for perhaps early operative intervention to decrease length of stay can also be built into these um, algorithms. So uh, I really think there's a lot that we can learn from each other and uh, hope you join us in, in sharing these, uh, um, uh, these resources. Uh, just kind of one more plug. Um, if you have interest in studying this further and really helping us understand how we can perform these surgeries better and more efficiently, the Pediatric Surgery Research Collaborative is interested in exploring a clinical trial involving potentially pleurectomy, pleurodesis, maybe another clinical arm. The main contact is Brian Gulak, who actually happens to be sitting there in the front. Here's his email address if any of you are interested. Thank you so much for your time, and we'll be happy to take questions. Okay, no questions. Okay. Fantastic presentation. Um, one of the things that I see uh, a lot when you're seeing data being presented uh, is, you know, people give you a hazard ratio or something along those lines, which is not really clinically useful when you're trying to talk to your patients. And you guys did a great job because you actually looked at what is the actual recurrence rates of a few different types of treatment. Uh, especially when you're looking at pleurodesis, pleurectomy, et cetera. Um, how did you account for, though, the fact that different studies have different lengths of uh, uh, follow-up and time to recurrence? And when you are putting together your chart, unless I missed it, you know, what exactly uh, time period is that recurrence rate in, the 3% the versus 9%, et cetera? <laughs> Thank you for your question. So um, follow-up period was is extremely variable. 
The prospective studies typically had one to two year follow up, which we felt to be adequate. There was multiple studies that looked at questions of like single incision, chest tube management, things like that, and they typically had only inpatient stay follow up or three month follow up. So first passes, we cut off all those studies. Um, but then we, we made no statistical allowance for a study that had a one year follow up versus an eight year follow up. In fact, some of the level four studies were done in East Asia where they have centralized health systems and excellent medical record systems. And so they were catching recurrences that happened you know, five, 10 years later that would never be caught in a prospective randomized controlled trial with a sort of two year follow up periods. Um, so there's certainly a lot of heterogeneity, which is why we encourage uh, a prospective um, multi center study in, in North America. Thank you very much to our panel.